So this is the first of the videos in the Jewels of Quakerism series proper. In which we will talk about what is the first jewel, the meeting for worship, the particular silent waiting expectant worship that is practiced by unprogrammed Quakers in the Religious Society of France. We'll look a little bit at scriptural origins, uh, potential scholarship on the scriptural references, um, some historical context, and then also some experiential uh, connectiveness regarding what it is that the unprogrammed meeting for worship actually is. So at the end of the other uh, video, the, the history and context of the origins of the Religious Society of Friends, we kind of ended with uh, the Fells and Fox. And so it's worth uh, going back to Fox to understand the origins of where the silent meeting for worship occurred. Now, there's no way to prove this necessarily. We have some references from Fox's own journals, but you know, short of a time machine, we can't be sure. However, there's a lot to suggest that when Fox went off on his own and he received some of these openings, you know, it was in that spirit of silence and, and solitude that, in fact, a lot of this religious uh, kind of realizations hit him. So from a very kind of personal or psychological level, it would make sense that the silence became important to George Fox. He was on his own. There are some stories about him sitting on like a, a haystack and having an opening and kind of being by himself on the river or on a hill at the top and the crest of Pendle Hill, the, the British Pendle Hill, there was an opening. And a lot of that was done alone and in, in silence without dialogue. So there's a lot to suggest that for Fox, the silence was incredibly important. And he came to believe that it was in that silence that... that um, it was easiest to kind of receive revelation and in that silence um, the light could search you out and kind of help you realize some of the better choices you need to make. Um, this is uh, from the book The Liturgies of Quakerism by uh, Pink Dandelion. It's on page 30 and it's a quote um, from Fox. Uh, the Complete uh, Works of Fox. This is volume 4. Now Thou must die in the silence to the fleshly wisdom, knowledge, reason, and understanding. Keep to that of God in you which will lead you up to God. When you are still from your own thoughts and imaginations and desires and counsels of your own hearts and emotions and will, when you stand single from all of these, waiting upon the Lord, your strength is renewed. So Fox had this very clear idea that in that silent waiting worship, you could have the negative things, the, um, the seeds of war, the, the, the dark things that we carried stripped away and be left still as a person, but as a renewed person there um, kind of in the silence, having received that refreshment um, in the silence from the spirit there. So Fox and himself and his own understandings of what the silence is and the potential that rests in that silence is very much an important part of the picture of where the unprogrammed meeting for worship comes from, at, at least from our perspective. Yeah. So next we're going to talk about the context, the political and some of the religious context out of which this form of worship emerged. So George Fox was in a period of England where there was struggle and strife and civil war and there was a lot of reaction we talked about this in the last video happening towards the Anglican Church and particularly an Anglican Church that was uh, taking higher and higher forms looking more and more like Catholicism and so they're in this seeking for truth various kinds of religious sects emerged trying to find a truer form of worship. There were the seekers, the ranters, the muggletonians, the diggers. And the dunkards. And the dunkards, all experimenting with forms of worship that felt like they were closer to church. Um, it's important also to think about at this time that people had more and more access to scripture. Copies of Bibles were appearing in homes, and people had access to reading the Bible at home. And, and this direct access to Scripture influenced um, how people, much people felt like they needed to go to the Anglican Church to have an experience of the Word of God. Yeah, and so one of the things that we think is worth quoting here is this great little uh, book 
It's a, it's, a, it's a Swarthmore lecture from Swarthmore Hall uh, by L. Violet Hodgkin. And the, the, the year that this lecture was given is 1919. And um, it's a great little book. Um, and there is a quote in here that's directly related to this context of silent worship. And it's, and it's worth going in. So um, we're on page 45 of this book. And it's a, she's quoting, Violet uh, Hodgkins is quoting uh, from William Penn's journal. And he's talking about the Seekers, which is another one of these religious traditions. Mm. So this is, this is Penn's voice here. As they, the Seekers, came to the knowledge of one another, they sometimes met together, not formally to pray or preach at appointed times and places in their own wills, as in times past they were accustomed to do, but they waited together in silence, and as anything rose in one of their minds that they thought favored a divine spring, so they sometimes spoke. Compare the following extract from Charles Marshall's journal. And in those times, about the year of 1654, there were many in those parts who were seeking after the Lord. And there were a few of us who kept one day in the week for fasting and prayer, so that when this day came, few met together early in the morning and did not taste anything. We sat down sometimes in silence. And as any found a concern on their spirits and inclination in their hearts, they kneeled down and sought to the Lord. So that sometimes before the day ended, there might be 20 of us pray, men and women. On some of those occasions, children would spake a few words in prayer. And we were sometimes greatly bowed and broken before the Lord in humility and in tenderness. So the silence of these seekers, thirsty souls that hunger, was not an addition to their worship. It was an essential part of it. Their silence came out of their seeking, and their seeking came out of their search for reality. To the plastic communities of seekers, George Fox was sent in the, his first divine fury of prophetic mission. And his strong soul acted as the signet to their gentle wax and stamped them with the indelible impression of Quakerism. Now, uh, that's pretty strong language and it suggests that the seekers are just kind of like passive souls floating around until Fox came along. And I imagine that that's somewhat less than true. However, it is uh, important to note within those two journal entries and um, this work from Hodgkin that the seekers were present there. And in fact, the seekers in lots of other traditions had incorporated silent worship as part of what they were doing. So it's not as if the silent worship kind of springs out of the nothingness and Quakerness in George Fox. It probably had something to do with him personally, as well as some of the things that were being practiced and some of the experiments that were being taken by some of the other denominations that were in England at that time. So we just mentioned these uh, groups of seekers and ranchers and dunkards and independent groups all over the English countryside who were coming up with uh, forms of worship that were remarkably similar to each other in their, um, in their leanness. And this kind of uh, form of worship that is minimalist, that seeks the silence, is called apophatic spirituality. And we think that it is an attempt to strip away, apophatic is a subtractive kind of spirituality, stripping away those pieces which are not God, particularly in reaction to the Anglican Church, which adds on um, incense and adds on bells, or the Eastern Orthodox Church, which adds on icons. A cataphatic approach adds... Uh, elements that bring us closer to the divine, an apophatic approach strips away those pieces which are not of God until you're left with nothing but the silent waiting and the piece of scripture from Matthew that says, where two or more of us are gathered, there I will be also. And it's difficult, right? Because you know, we talk about stripping away that which is not of God, but I mean, maybe those are holy bells. Maybe they're holy vestments and holy music. So it's, it's definitely a balance. And the friends clearly thought that a lot of that was an apostate, an, an apostasy, which is to say fallen out of favor with the church, and that they wanted to remove all those things which were not the true church and which were somehow unnecessary superfluities. Well, and they were also seeking to remove those forms which were merely forms without power. There was seeking towards the life. Where is the life? Is there life in this? Am I saying this particular 
Am I repeating this part of the liturgy because it's a habit or because there's life in it? And right. and I think seeking towards the life and stripping away those those forms that are habitual but not with power, they were they got to the silence and and directly to that power. Right. And I mean, so it's important, again, the silent worship did not emerge fully sprung somewhere, then friends discovered it or invented it. It was the, the form of worship and the silent unprogrammed worship, as well as some of the other social testimonies and things that were going on with the early religious society of friends, are absolutely a dissenting mark. Right. They are a rebellious, uh, revolutionary, um, reactive spirituality having to do with the other things that were going on at that period in time. Um, the next piece is to share some of the scripture that may or may not have impacted early friends. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the, uh, the Bible is becoming more readily available to folks. And even though Fox, um, and some mostly early on the converts to the religious society of friends were of a, uh, lower class, uh, farmers as opposed to gentry, um, they had access to scripture. And while modern liberal friends are somewhat more universal in their approach to um, holy texts, it's absolutely the case that the early friends were amazingly conversant with scripture, especially Fox. So while we don't know and we can't and don't want to proof text scripture as a reason for the silent meaning for worship, there are pieces of uh, the Hebrew scriptures as well as the New Testament that seem to suggest or support um, why it was the early friends had this silent meaning for worship. A lot of this work has been done uh, by Pink Dandelion and his book, uh, The Liturgies of Quakerism, as well as by Doug Gwynn and a lot of the scholarship that he's done. Uh, so this kind of information is very leans very heavily on their work, and we wanted to acknowledge that. Okay. So first up... Um, the first passage comes from 1 Corinthians 14. Right. So here, um, Paul is... Uh, writing to the church in Corinth. Uh, he says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophecy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in tongues builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophecy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. <laughs> so a lot of what the early friends were doing in this silent meeting for worship um, was waiting to receive something to speak. So sometimes today people say, you know, you speak when you feel like you're supposed to. And I think the early friends would have articulated to say, be silent until until you are filled with the Spirit and and then speak that which is given to you. And, and you prophecy. And friends really understood that what they were doing when they were speaking in the silent meeting for worship in prayer it is speaking um, in, in God's voice. Now, there's a lot of symbolic power in that. There's a lot of... Uh, kind of scriptural poetry that's happening when you say that, but they really had this really powerful understanding that what they were doing was speaking God's God's word, and it was a, a prophetic in the sense not of future telling or of soothsaying, but of truth revealing. So apocalypse really means removing the veil. So what they were doing was they were speaking apocalyptically, they were speaking prophetically, they were speaking truth. It's kind of like. Uh, that their prophecy was acknowledging the spiritual elephant in the corner of the room and saying, man, this thing has really been getting us. We need to name this thing and we need to understand it and figure out how to proceed together as a community. So prophecy, to a large degree, is, is what Paul is calling the Church of Corinth to, but also what friends thought that they were doing in, in the silent meeting for worship. And so the next piece of scripture is Revelation 8. Right. So again, here we are in the apocalypse. You know, the world is ending Things are all over the place, falling apart, and um, the yeah, seals well, the seals are being broken. And when the seventh seal is broken, kind of uh, we're at the end. And uh, so the the piece <clears throat> there is in uh, Revelation eight, and it's the seventh seal. And when the Lamb, right, the Lamb of God, when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. So it's a very short piece, and it kind of comes out of nowhere. But it's interesting to consider that if friends. If friends thought that in the civil unrest that was happening and all of the, the warring and the, the, the kind of disintegration of, of the social state and um, to some degree the political state, 
and and the ending of the Church of right. England, right? Ending or what they understood to be the ending yeah. of the Church of England. That in fact, you know, their understanding is the end times might be near. And so early on, some of the scholarship suggests that the Friends believed that the world was ending in a in a literal, concrete way. And so the Revelation scripture that uh, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour suggests, that, at least to some folks, that that silent meeting for worship was a reenactment, a liturgical reenactment of the, the moments prior to the end of the world. Now, even if, the, you know, it wasn't the end of the world, which we can look back at, you know, 350 years later and realize it, it wasn't, there's a, there's, a, there's a powerful thing there. So what if in the meeting for worship, you are sitting and worshiping mm -hmm. in that silence as if it is the end, mm -hmm. if, if there's no getting up, if, if as if when the, the silent meeting for worship is completed, world's end, what will you realize about yourself? What will you see about your life? And what kinds of things will you let go and realize they're not what you want to be doing with your, with your time and your energy and your money? So there's a powerful experience there, too, that, mm -hmm. that if, if, if we treat that half hour or hour of silent worship as if it's the moment right before the end, well, then suddenly there's realization that we can have about ourselves and our community in that space, which is different than just like hanging out for an hour because like that's what you do on Sunday mornings. Um, the next piece of scripture is, you might have to help me with this, Matthew 18. Yes, Matthew 18. Okay. Da, 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 da. So um, the, the piece in Matthew is um, kind of also... Um, something that we referenced earlier right. it's the it's the piece and it's jesus speaking in matthew's gospel and he says uh for two or three for when two or three are gathered in my name there i am among them so uh there's the silence before the maybe before the ending before the apocalypse there's a desire for prophecy which is to say speaking right. of the lord and then there's the fact that jesus says in the gospel of matthew that when two or more gather in his name uh, jesus the, the spirit the holy spirit is present so uh, if we are gathered in in worship uh, it is possible that the holy spirit which is always present in this in this gathered body will in fact uh, be the the muse or the inspiration for the speaking of someone who gives ministry and this is totally consonant with fox's opening that there is one christ jesus who has come to teach us and will teach us himself that we have as gathered friends access to the inner teacher and and so connected to this piece of scripture from Matthew there is that um, gathering and that opportunity to be taught by the great teacher right and so and it's interesting to actually think about what prophecy is here it's, it's really important because in the in the early Hebrew the the word for prophet has this root in this word I think it's like nave or something like that and it, it's it's a it's an adjective which means a hollowness or a hollow vessel you could apply it to like a, a pot or a pipe or something and so the prophet becomes this sounding tube or a um, an amplification for some sound. It's a, it's a hollow vessel. And that was really the understanding that friends had, is that when you um, spoke in a meeting for worship, you weren't speaking what you wanted to or what you thought was a good idea. You could do that, and you could do that on the street and in connection and in conversation and in fellowship. But the meeting for worship was not a time for you to speak. It was a time for silent prayer. And if, by chance, the, the Spirit kind of inspired, really inspired, in spiritus, it inspired you, then you would speak what it, what it gave you. That was their understanding. And, and early friends, we have at least some reason to believe, differentiated between their own voice and the voice of spirit by speaking in a very nasal tone so that uh, when early friends gave ministry, they didn't use their normal speaking voice. They changed their voice so that people would know it wasn't a human speaking, but God speaking. That's probably not what they sounded like. But the idea is that there's a difference between just talking in meeting because you've got something to offer and actually truly being inspired. Uh, now that seems a little put on to you know most of us um, today, but uh, you know the idea is there. And what's more, there were different social practices in the meeting for worship. So if someone was simply uh, preaching and they were speaking and right. making points, um, they would rise and stand um, and everyone would listen to the inspired preaching. But when someone rose with a prophetic piece or a prayer to offer, they would rise and take off their hat, which is something they very rarely did, and then everyone else would kneel in worship. 
<laughs> and the social ramifications of that are a big deal. The friends never took off their hat because, you know, they felt like they only owed that respect to, to God. Well, when prayer starts, right. God is in their midst. Right. And so they dang well better take off their hat. And so they owe that respect to God in the middle of that prophetic speech. Right. And then they all kneel in prayer because the presence of God is there. So we don't do that, to my knowledge, in any meeting uh, of any denomination or any sect of Quakerism anymore. But socially, I, I like the idea that if we're really going to take the meeting for worship seriously and suggest that some of the ministry that's offered can truly be from the spirit, then, then how do we, let's acknowledge that some of the preaching is simply gifts and skills and, and people elucidating scripture and things that they heard. And, you know, it's useful and it builds up the body, but it's different than actual pr prophetic uh, speech. And I, I might be trying to make a, too much of a distinction there, but I, I am trying to make it maybe a little bit more black and white than it actually was just for the sake of the, uh, for the analogy and the comparison, because I think it's useful to think about the difference between prophetic inspired speech and simply kind of a good idea that is just, you know, worth building folks up. Or teaching and preaching. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, we wanted to share some of our understanding of what we think the meeting for worship is and um, how the meeting for worship functions in the body. Because really, um, unlike meditation or a group meditation which is a collection of individuals who are doing their own sort of personal centering and their own personal um, processing and letting go a meeting for worship is a corporate event uh, it has been referred to as corporate or group mysticism it's a seeking together for the will of God and each person that's present in the meeting for worship is present to that group mystical seeking for the towards the will of God. There's um, some images that have been used to talk about the meeting for worship as a net that we're we're caught up together in the divine net, and we and we move as a group closer to the divine as we deepen in our worship. Now it's a tricky kind of thing because you could easily understand something like that and say like oh it's suddenly at some moment all of the Quakers who are gathered together in meaningful worship like understand the truth and that's not really in my understanding kind of what happens it's much more of a gradual process and even then there's some doubting it's not a magical experience upon which people realize that they all need to go out and save pandas or something you know it, it, it is a process of growth and a knitting together of the community and that mystical experience is just this profound deepening or sense of kind of a connectedness that happens and slowly through that the group begins to kind of be bound together in an understanding of how they're connected well and if if <clears throat> in fox's opening there's this possibility of being searched by the light mm -hmm. and being convicted of my sinfulness and i share to my fellows sick my sense of that conviction of truth and as we sit in worship, that truth is heard and rings as true. We then go out into the world to experiment with that truth. We, um, early friends, believed that convicted of our sinfulness, naturally a conversion of life would follow the experiments to, to live outside of that sinfulness. That's the theory of perfection, but we'll talk about that later. So the, the meaning for worship was a place where that spiritual elephant in the room could be right. named and say, you know what, we keep slaves. And you know what, that's really weighing on me. And quite frankly, I think it's weighing on us all. You know, friends, I think we need to stop carrying slaves. And that might be a prophetic, you know, uh, utterance, a realization that this was the case. And for some people, it might really hit them and say, wow. You're, you're right, you speak truth, friend. You know, that friend speaks my mind. Right. And then, of course, the follow-through has to be after the meaningful worship when they begin to convert and they begin to kind of adopt new habits and change as a result of some of the things. Right. If, if it's just a time to get together and say profound things and the rest of your life doesn't change, well, then it's not really much of anything at all. Right. It has to somehow touch your life outside of the meeting for worship, too. So the greeting among friends, how does the truth prosper among you, is evidence of this how are we living the truth that's discovered in the meeting for worship right should we share the definition yeah so, so we, we've put together a definition yeah um of of the meeting for worship which is the meeting for worship draws us into radical relationship with the divine and 
one another gives us the opportunity to see the world differently and to be changed and propels us out into the world. Should I read it again? Yeah, do that. So there's three prongs to it. The meeting for worship has three points, as it were. That's our argument, at least. So it draws us into radical relationship with the divine and one another. It gives us the opportunity to see the world differently and to be changed. And it propels us out into the world to enact that changeness. Right. And so the three pieces of that are, you know, in the radical relationship, something to note there is that the word radical, often people think about meaning out at the fringe, but it also means... Radical is rootedness. And, and radical, actually, if you know anything about botany, is not just the root, but it's the growing tip of the root that pushes deeper into the soil. Right. So the radical means like the rootedness. So you, uh, you come into a radical relationship. And so like physically, sometimes that's an experience of... Uh, for some folks, quaking or shaking or just a per goosebumps or some kind of profound uh, physical alteration or emotional, just, you know, tears or some, some kind of relationship with the divine. There's that radical presence there. And sometimes as a result of that, you also feel bonded to one another. So there's a radical relationship. That's the first part. Uh, the second thing is you see the world differently. Um, sometimes when people speak and name that spiritual elephant in the room you suddenly see it for the first time. And so your the perception and perspective in the world can be changed in the meeting for worship. And then hopefully there's a refreshment and some kind of energy that, that it sustains you and nourishes you and helps you kind of connect with your community and each other so that when uh, you go back out to kind of go do the other things in your life, there's this power and energy and a realization that you're part of this project to help kind of bring about a more just world. So all three of those things together kind of dance with each other in tension and resonance as part of what the function of the meeting for worship is. And I think we would say, and you can comment on this, that if, it, if you're doing just one of those things and only ever just one of those things, that you're, there's a missing out on the fullness of the meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. are, there are times when you might go at a stretch and, and really need refreshment because of some part of your own life. But on the whole, over the large arc of what the meaning for worship is, it's important that these three figures kind of all eventually surface to the top and, and, and are part of what the meeting experience is for you. Right, right. So that brings to a close this exploration of, of really the first jewel of Quakerism, the form of meaning for worship among unprogrammed friends, the expectant worship, waiting worship, silent worship. And some of why we feel like it is one of the jewels and some of the places that we feel it emerged um, and is unique to the Religious Society of Friends. You know, it's um, certainly not the, the most important part of the Religious Society, but uh, in a course on Quakerism, it seems particularly important to talk about this particular, peculiar form of worship that Friends uh, traditionally have. So we hope that the, this was informative to you and useful. And um, we'll be coming up the next video next week with the next jewel of Quakerism. So stay in touch and feel free to be in touch.